I closed the door quietly after stealing one last glance at my sleeping nine-year-old daughter Annie. In the small kitchen, my wife Sarah was busy preparing our morning coffee. Brad, remember you have to take Annie to the doctor today, and we need to do the laundry, Sarah reminded me. I nodded, slipping up behind Sarah in our compact apartment kitchen and giving her neck a quick kiss. Sure thing, Sarah. I'll try to make it quick at the clinic this morning. How about I just hit delete on all your clothes? I teased. Sarah chuckled and reached around to pat my groin playfully. I love it when you talk laundry. It really gets me going. Just don't start reorganizing the kitchen cabinets, or I might have to teach you a lesson, she replied sarcastically. I laughed and gave her a playful smack on her shapely behind. Are you taking the bus to work today? That thing's always running late. Sarah shrugged without turning around. James is pretty understanding about it. He knows how unreliable the buses are in this town. I just hope the car starts until payday. James was James Madison, Sarah's boss at Madison Industries, a small family-run business where Sarah had worked since she was a temp in high school. As I started to put on my jacket, I asked, couldn't you get a payday advance? Sarah sighed. No luck there. HR said I've already reached the limit, and I hate to ask James to override them again. Come on, Sarah. James has known you since you were sorting envelopes there. I'm sure he'd cut you some slack this time. Sarah shook her head. That was back when his dad was in charge. James is really trying to follow the rules. It's like he's got the Ten Commandments and the company SOP in hand, she joked, sipping her coffee. I practically wrote half those rules during my junior year of high school when I was working there. I chuckled. SOPs are made by people on paper, not handed down from a mountain. Sarah stifled a laugh. James is just a big nerd. I'll ask him again today. Sarah, he's been chasing you since high school. Just where something that catches his eye, I teased. Sarah playfully swatted at me. Oh, hush. James isn't that bad. He's just trying to figure things out since taking over the company. And he's already done a lot for us. I'm not worried about him bending over backward, I joked. Sarah made a face and gently pushed me toward the door. Go to the clinic and hurry back. I'll get Annie up, fed, and dressed by the time you're back. Nodding, I glanced out of the window of our cramped apartment at the breaking dawn. The sky glowed with a deep red hue, evoking the old maritime adage, red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in morning, sailor take warning. As I opened the door to leave, I checked my watch inside. It was Thursday. I had five days left until my demise. Walking through the dawn's faint breeze, I tightened my jacket against the chill and paused at an intersection for a red light. I reflected on an article I had read, suggesting that most people in relationships can only endure three major life-altering events within a certain period. My three events were approaching like waves crashing on the shore. First was the loss of my job. It had been a position I enjoyed, with supportive colleagues and a profitable company. However, any absence from work, regardless of the reason, led inevitably to termination. Second was the foreclosure of our family home. It hadn't been the most luxurious house, but Sarah and I had poured our hearts into renovating it. Sarah had transformed it into a cozy haven, complete with a sizable backyard and a separate bedroom for our daughter, Anne. However, missed mortgage payments and an unpaid home equity loan had led the banks to reclaim it. Dealing with the first two challenges had been difficult, but it was the third that loomed largest. Our beloved daughter and had been diagnosed with a fatal medical condition. Worse still, it was classified as one of the orphan diseases, too rare for pharmaceutical companies to invest in treatments or cures due to low profitability. Anne's correct diagnosis had been a stroke of luck, stemming from her pediatrician's chance encounter at a medical conference with a lesser-known researcher. Specialists were scarce, appointments were hard to secure, and my time once devoted to work now revolved around caring for Anne. Insurance coverage was inadequate, denying essential specialists and labeling most treatments as experimental and thus not covered. Consequently, the money meant for our mortgage had dwindled, our savings were depleted, and we had fallen behind on rent. 
The only remaining asset of value was my sizable life insurance policy from my former employer, set to lapse at the month's end. Similar to George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life, I was worth more dead than alive. The sound of the blinking walk sign brought me back to the present, and I cautiously checked both ways before crossing the bustling intersection known in our local media as the most dangerous traffic location in the state. In five days, this would be the path I walked to secure financial support for my family. My destination was a nondescript strip mall housing the usual mix, an Asian takeout joint, a martial arts school, and a convenience store. Pushing open the door marked with faded lit LW research lettering, I approached the reception desk with its sliding window and picked up the clipboard hanging on the wall. The frosted glass window slid open, revealing Marge, an older lady in a white smock, who raised her coffee cup in greeting. Morning, Brad, she said, peering down at her list. Here for the clinical trial, hair growth, erectile dysfunction, or toenail fungus. Focused on filling out the form, I replied without looking up, toenail fungus. Last visit. Marge glanced over the form while finishing her coffee. All right, just making sure we don't accidentally give you hair where you don't want it. She cracked a smile. How soon do we get paid? Knowing the routine, I grinned back. You mail the check in 10 business days? She nodded. Correct. This one pays a grand. Marge flipped through another page on her clipboard. Interested in the seasickness study at the end of the month? Pays $5,000, but you'll be at sea for a week. Shaking my head, I declined politely, thanks, but no. I can't be away from my daughter. Marge frowned sympathetically. Forgot about Ann. How's she doing? I shrugged, my voice heavy with worry. No change. Taking her to another specialist today. We're still hopeful, but... I trailed off, unable to finish. Marge's expression turned serious as she reached through the window, shaking her finger at me. Listen, Brad. I was a Navy nurse on the USS Sanctuary, seeing miracles happen. Keep your head up and don't give up on your little girl. Taken aback by her blunt sincerity, I tried to lighten the mood. Easy, Marge. Remember, swearing isn't. Shut it, she interrupted gruffly. I'm already ugly. Your wife better not have your defeatist attitude. I shook my head. No, Sarah's incredible. She wishes she could stay home with Anne, but my job paid better insurance. Marge scowled at her empty cup before tossing it away. You two need to be strong for her. Keep the faith. A good father would do anything for his daughter. I took a deep breath, meeting her gaze firmly. Marge, I'd die for my daughter. She nodded, her eyes softening. Then keep that fire, Brad. Your family needs it. As I turned to leave, her words echoed in my mind, mingling with the noise of the busy street outside. It was Sunday evening. Sarah was tending to our daughter, and I was walking back to our apartment after finishing a cash-loading job. As I stood at the intersection, waiting for the signal light, I couldn't shake the knowledge that in less than 24 hours, my life would end right there. It seemed like a foolproof plan. This intersection was notorious for accidents, hidden by a blind curve that made it difficult for speeding trucks coming off the interstate to see the traffic light in time to stop. Despite numerous accidents, authorities hadn't resolved the issue, and investigations revealed a memo suggesting it was cheaper to pay insurance claims than fix the intersection. A bit of research online confirmed that my death would simply be another statistic buried in government budgets after being calculated by an actuarial table. My plan was straightforward. During the morning rush hour, I'd walk to this intersection where every third semi seemed to run the light. I'd time it to step into the path of one of these speeding 80,000-pound vehicles. The traffic cameras, used for issuing tickets, would record the truck running the red light while I had the right-of-way. It would be over quickly. For two weeks, I had been passing by this intersection, hoping that the tragedy of a terminally ill child losing her father due to bureaucratic negligence would catch the attention of the local media and expedite a settlement. As the light turned green and the walk sign lit up, Indicating it was safe to cross, I hesitated for a moment, glancing both ways before stepping off the curb. An odd thought crossed my mind. What should I have for my last meal? 
Entering our apartment, I finally decided, after a mental debate, on Fruit Loops and orange juice with wheat toast. Not because it was my preference, but because it was what we had in the house. Sarah was seated on our worn sofa in her coat. She turned her cheek as I leaned in to kiss her on the lips. Going somewhere, honey? I asked casually. Sarah played with her purse nervously. Brad, there's no easy way to say this. I'm filing for divorce and taking in with me. Her words took a moment to register in my mind. Then, as if all the air had been sucked out of the room and I had been struck with a blunt force, I staggered backward and collapsed heavily into one of our worn kitchen chairs. Sarah took a deep breath before continuing. The divorce papers are on the table with the attorney's name. I'm not asking for alimony or child support. I'll have full custody of Anne, but you can visit her whenever you want. My brain finally kicked into gear, and I leaped out of my chair, rushing into Anne's room. It was empty, just a bed without her belongings. Returning to Sarah, I confronted her. So you're taking a sick child away from her father, but I get to see my own daughter whenever I want? What the hell is wrong with you? Sarah glanced down at her purse. This is best for all of us. I'm not trying to hurt you. I scoffed bitterly. Not trying to hurt me? No, you're not thinking about me at all. Ignoring my outburst, Sarah stood up. The back rent is paid, and the lease is covered for three months. There's a new starter for the car, which is now yours. There's also $500 cash in that envelope for utilities. What's the matter, Sarah? Couldn't your boyfriend cough up 20 pieces of silver for this betrayal? Sarah flinched. Leave James out of this. He had nothing to do with my decision. So you and my abducted daughter aren't staying with James? I pressed. Sarah looked away. Yes, but it's not abduction. And thinks she's on a holiday. I had to step back to avoid losing control. Oh, well then, that makes it all okay, doesn't it? As long as the kidnapper has a nice van and good candy, everything's fine. I headed for the door, but Sarah grabbed my sleeve. And isn't with James right now, Brad. If you go over there, you'll just get arrested. It took all my restraint not to lash out. I shot her a look of pure contempt, and she let go of my arm, stepping back. Sarah, never threaten a man who has nothing left to lose. The next day, I endured a lengthy journey involving three buses and a two-mile walk to reach the legal aid clinic. I arrived early, but it wasn't until late afternoon that a young, overwhelmed clerk, who seemed barely out of high school, finally took a quick glance through my divorce paperwork in a corner of the office. What seems to be the problem, he asked, stuffing the forms back into the folder. Your wife is covering everything, no alimony, no child support with no strings attached to your earnings now or in the future. You get generous visitation and up to two months with your child each summer. Most guys would consider this a great deal in a divorce. I was taken aback by his nonchalant attitude. Yeah, and I'd kill for a Nobel Peace Prize, but that's not the point. My wife took my daughter away from me. The young attorney leaned forward, placing a reassuring hand on my knee. I'm not a parent, so I won't pretend to understand your feelings. Legally, though, it's not considered kidnapping if your wife isn't preventing you from seeing your child. He gestured towards the folder I held. You could fight this if you have the time and resources. But the law firm on those papers is well-funded with strong connections. Someone with significant financial backing is behind this. He leaned back in his chair. Talk to your wife. If she has any conscience left, you might negotiate a better arrangement than what the courts would grant you. Frankly, your chances in court are slim. I threw up my hands in frustration. Great odds. It's me and God against the establishment and everything else. The attorney shrugged. As Napoleon said, God fights on the side with the heaviest artillery. You'd be facing an uphill battle. Three days later, I found myself standing at my soon-to-be ex-wife's boss's house. James answered the door nervously. Uh, Brad, Sarah isn't here. I maintained a neutral expression and tone. I don't care about her. She's your problem. I'm here for my daughter. 
James looked flustered. Um, well, I don't know. How about we bring it over to your place later? I stared past him into the house. I don't live there anymore. I know my daughter is here. Please tell him that her father is here. Truthfully, I had sublet my apartment for cash via Craigslist and was now living out of my car. It wasn't ideal, but staying there meant not selling out my daughter for three months' rent. James continued to glance nervously around. I'm not sure what Sarah would say. I don't care about her. She's your problem. I'm only here for my daughter. I pushed the door open wider behind him and called out loudly, and... And... It's Dad. Come on out. Moments later, my squealing daughter ran out and jumped into my arms. Daddy, where have you been? Mommy and Daddy Jay said you were busy on a trip and I'm staying here now. I cherished the moment of holding my child close before responding. Daddy Jay? I glanced at James briefly before turning back to Ann. Did they say that? All right, sweetheart, go get in the car and buckle up and slipped from my arms and skipped happily towards the car. As I watched her go, I felt James' hand grip my shoulder. Um, Brad, I'm not sure Sarah would approve. How do I know you're going to bring him back? James's grip on my shoulder was feeble, clearly unused to physical confrontation. I covered his hand with mine, keeping my voice calm and steady. I've already told you, I don't care about Sarah. She's your problem, I asserted, increasing the pressure on his hand. And you're right, you don't know if I'll bring him back. I tightened my grip further, trying to keep my anger in check. What did my daughter call you? James paled. Daddy Jay, he stammered, attempting to withdraw his hand. Sarah and I thought it would be less confusing for him. I intensified the pressure on his hand, controlling my rage. Listen, Daddy Jay, I said sharply. That's not going to happen. You're Mr. J to my daughter. Not daddy, not uncle, nothing but Mr. Do you understand? James's face drained of color as he whispered, but what if Sarah doesn't agree? I gave him a thin smile, whispering back with menace, again, I don't care about Sarah. She's your problem. The only reason you're still standing here is my daughter. If something happens to N, you'll regret it. Beads of sweat appeared on James's forehead. That's not fair. We both know she has a critical condition. Feeling the fragile bones in his hand, I applied maximum pressure. I don't care. You took on this responsibility. Now you bear the consequences. If my daughter and suffers because of you, you'll suffer too. A man with nothing to lose is dangerous. I released his hand, and James pulled back, nursing his injured hand. He spat defiantly, you're bluffing. Waving dismissively as I walked away from the porch, I retorted, in poker, a point four four magnum beats four aces. Later that evening, I returned to drop it off at Sarah's place. Sarah rushed out as I pulled into the driveway, her relief palpable as in stepped out of my car, and ran up to Sarah, carrying bags from various stores. Mom, Dad, and I had so much fun. Look at all the stuff we got. Sarah forced a smile and addressed him. That's wonderful, sweetheart. Why don't you go inside? Daddy J, uh, Mr. James has your dinner in the microwave. And shook her head enthusiastically. Daddy and I had Dairy Queen. We had hot dogs and ice cream. Sarah sighed, conceding. All right then, put your stuff in your room. You can show it to me after I talk to your father and glanced at me, and I nodded towards the door. Go ahead, and I'll call you tonight. And kissed me on the cheek and hurried upstairs to the door. Once and was out of earshot, Sarah turned her fury on me. Where the hell have you been? I've been in a panic. You know damn well our daughter has a medical condition. Wow, I interrupted sarcastically. My daughter also has a medical condition. I pulled out a small baggie from my pocket. Here are all her test results. They're normal. Or did you forget that I've been Anne's primary caregiver for the past five months? Sarah's frustration seemed to dissipate as she ran her hand through her hair. 
James had no idea where you went or when you'd be back. I had nightmares of you taking in to Mexico. I pretended to be shocked. Me? Break my word? I pride myself on keeping my promises, unlike some. Sarah's eyes flashed with anger. Did you threaten James? He's talking about getting a restraining order. I shrugged casually. I made no threats, only promises. And I always keep my word. A restraining order would only hasten James's demise. Sarah studied me intensely. This neighborhood is heavily patrolled. The police could be here in under ten minutes. Again, I shrugged nonchalantly. A police car in ten minutes versus a .44 caliber bullet at 1,425 feet per second. Which race do you think you'd rather be on? She recoiled at the implication. Why are you doing this? I theatrically pretended to check an imaginary list. Well, Sarah, I'm reviewing my receipts and it seems I didn't buy any of your bullshit. If any harm comes to us, you'll never see your daughter again. Once more, I shrugged. If you get a restraining order, I won't see her anyway. Did you really expect to back a man into a corner and not have him fight back? Sarah looked genuinely shocked. You would do this to the mother of your child? I shook my head solemnly. I'll make sure that's on your tombstone if you keep me from my daughter. Sarah looked down at her hands. Brad, can't we move past this? I laughed bitterly. How can I? Every time I step outside, everything I see reminds me of you, rotting garbage in cans, dog shit on the sidewalk, dead animals in the road. She wrapped her arms around herself. Can't you just forgive and forget? I'm neither Jesus nor do I have Alzheimer's, I replied sharply. You're self-absorbed and full of shit like used diapers. But let's talk about visitation for Anne's sake. After this, we'll never speak unless it's about her. I urgently needed a job and a place to stay, and Marge, the old nurse from the testing center, seemed to have a solution for both. My boyfriend owns his own company and is always looking for help, Marge said, lighting one cigarette from the end of another. You have a boyfriend? I asked, curious. Marge shot me a dirty look. What? You think this old bra can't still have a love life? We've been living together and enjoying each other for over 15 years. You're living together in sin? I teased Marge. What would your mother say? Marge chuckled. You can ask her. Mom's 98 and been shacked up with her boyfriend at Century Village for a decade now. She flicked the old cigarette but into the trash. My man's retired Navy, Chief Petty Officer. His company handles big marine rigs, tankers, cruise ships, oil rigs, when they're in dry dock. Cleaning out gray water and black water tanks, it's a shitty job. Hot, 14-hour days for 10 to 12 days straight. Pays good, benefits are solid, but you live aboard the ship, no AC most times, bad food, no running water, and bunking with a bunch of stinky men. Most guys don't last 24 hours. I shrugged. No expenses on site, though? I asked. Marge nodded. Damn, Marge, when can I start? Marge pulled out her phone. Let me call him. He's got two ships lined up back to back in a Bahama shipyard for Royal Viking Cruise Line in a few days. Short two guys. I clapped my hands together. Fantastic. Now, I just need to find a place to live. Marge waved at me. I think I can help you there, too. We've got a small studio above the garage. Last tenant left about six months ago, fully furnished. Want it? It's yours, just let me print up a lease. I nodded enthusiastically. Marge, my luck's been like a bald man winning a comb until now. Thanks. Marge wasn't kidding about it being a shitty job. It was easily the worst job I'd ever had. The protective gear and mask were uncomfortable, the hours were long, the food was terrible, and the living conditions, intermittent running water, and cramped sleeping quarters were almost unbearable. I would have quit a dozen times a day, but the pay was good, and Marge's boyfriend, the old chief petty officer, knew how to run a crew and get the most out of his people. 
Most of the crew were international, but they all shared a passion for football, or soccer, as I knew it. Every damn guy from every nation spent their precious downtime watching the sport instead of sleeping or arguing over player stats and their nation's chances in the World Cup. I tried to get into it, but watching guys run around for 90 minutes and not score just wasn't my thing. I might as well have been watching my co-workers at bars trying to pick up girls. Speaking of which, my luck with the ladies wasn't much better. They say the best boxers abstain from sex before a match. If that were true, I was well on my way to becoming the greatest boxer in history. However, the upside of downtime between jobs was that I could spend every moment with my daughter, Anne. I was saving every penny for our two months together this summer. I would cleared my schedule and checked with Anne's doctors to ensure none of our activities would affect her condition and that medical facilities were close by. Then came the note. I had packed the car and drove to my ex-wife Sarah and her new partner James' house to pick up my daughter and ready to start our adventure. I was more excited than a kid on Christmas Eve. That excitement turned to dread when I saw the envelope. Daddy was written in Anne's tentative cursive handwriting and taped to the screen door. Dear Daddy, guess where I am going? A whole nother country. Isn't that the coolest? Mom and Mr. J said we are going to spend the whole summer traveling around the entire continent and see a bunch of different countries. How awesome is that? We get to fly in the front of the plane where all the snobbish people sit and eat the good food and have as many ice cream bars as we want and a big TV with tons of movies. Too bad you are working. It would be cool if you could be with me. Love, Anne. I stared at the little hearts over each eye in the letter, my vision blurred with rising anger, feeling the veins pulsing in my temple. A string of curses, worthy of my old chief petty officer boss, erupted from my mouth as I carefully folded my daughter's letter back into the envelope with trembling hands. As expected, calls to Anne's, Sarah's, and even James' phones all went straight to voicemail. In frustration, I dialed one last number. Madison Industries, how may I direct your call? I'm trying to reach the owner, James. It's about my daughter, and I'm sorry, James is on extended vacation overseas and cannot be reached. Oh wait, are you Sarah's ex-husband? We all just love and when she comes here, what a sweet girl. You must be so excited about her trip overseas. What a great experience for her and her mother. Yes, if I were any happier, I would shit in my hands and clap. I beg your pardon? Forget it, I sighed, massaging my forehead. Is there any way to get in contact with them? It's pretty important. I'm afraid not, the receptionist replied. I can take a message. Oh wait, I have a copy of a document here for you in case you called. Do you want me to fax it over to you? We don't have fax machines where I live. Really? Where do you live? In the present day, those stone tablets and papyrus scrolls are in short supply. The receptionist chuckled. I know, right? But all legal documents can only be faxed or hand-delivered. Do you want me to send a messenger with the documents? That depends. Will the messenger be using modern transportation or the Pony Express with carrier pigeons? Once again, I found myself in a law office, but this time I was a paying client with an attorney who specialized in family law. She was a former JAG from the Navy, known to Marge, and her demeanor suggested she was seasoned and accustomed to command. Sorry, Brad, but everything is in order, she said, placing the papers back on the desk. As the custodial parent, your wife has the right to request changes to visitation. These papers, she tapped on the documents, are a request for modification for this summer trip. You had five business days to respond, or by default, you agree to the terms set forth. Bullshit! I exclaimed. I was deep in the bowels of a black water tank on a ship in the mobile Alabama shipyard all last week. I only got back two days ago and haven't even been to the post office to pick up my mail. Trying to calm myself, I continued, that woman knew that. I call my daughter and every damn night before she goes to bed. Sneaky X never said a thing about this trip. The lawyer waved dismissively. I gather you and your wife aren't exactly best friends? I shook my head. We play nice around and, and I never badmouth Sarah to her. It's not Anne's fault her mother is a cheating liar. 
and is a little girl with a medical condition. She doesn't need any more stress. But right now, if I were in a room with Bin Laden, Sarah, and Hitler with a gun that had only two bullets, I'd shoot my wife twice. The attorney chuckled. Well, there's not much we can do about it now. I can file paperwork with the court, but taking your daughter on a first-class summer trip around the world isn't exactly frowned upon by family courts. She raised her hand to preempt my objection. Yes, yes, I know you weren't informed, but the court will likely see it as an honest mistake. At worst, your wife might get a warning to communicate more clearly. On the bright side, this incident goes on record, and if anything like this happens again, we'll be in a stronger position. If you want to proceed, I'll need a retainer. Sure, I said, pulling out my credit card as an idea formed in my mind. Late that night, I retrieved the key from its hiding place in the backyard of Sarah and Jane's house. I mentally thanked Ann for the tip about the key location, reminding myself that kids have no privacy filters. Entering the darkened house, I recalled the layout from the company parties James' parents used to host when they were alive and running the business. Quietly ascending the stairs, I found the guest restroom with its simple sink and toilet. Kneeling down, my pen light found the old water line leading to the toilet tank. It was corroded, just as I had hoped, and a gentle tug caused a small break with a slow, steady stream of water. Extinguishing the pen light, I swiftly exited the residence. Justice might be blind, but court time and attorney billable hours never come cheap. I burned through a significant portion of the funds earmarked for my vacation with N, and since my boss had a full crew already, I turned to Marge for any lead she might have. Marge blew a stream of smoke toward the ceiling. Brad, one of the guys needs help at the convention, setting up and tearing down for four days. Pays $200 a day, but you gotta kick back $50 a day to the crew boss. Sign me up, Marge, I replied. And that's how I found myself standing in line at the concession stand, trying unsuccessfully not to stare at the shapely, spandex-clad buttocks of the girl in front of me. She was dressed in some risque Asian schoolgirl outfit, tapping away on her smartphone. Ahead of us was a large guy dressed like a bad imitation of the jolly green giant from the boxes of frozen vegetables in my freezer. Hey, Justine, the guy called out to the girl ahead of me. Wanna hear a joke about my penis? Oh wait, you can't, it's too long. His group of costumed friends erupted in laughter. Justine didn't even look up from her phone. Well, Rick, I could tell you a joke about my vagina, but you'll never get it. The group ahead of us laughed, and even the jolly green giant joined in before responding, Wow, Justine, you're one tough one. Still tapping away on her phone, Justine replied, I've been called worse, Rick, like your girlfriend. If Rick was offended, he didn't show it. Pointing at the menu above the concession window, he called out, Look, fish tacos. It reminds me of you, Justine. Justine finally glanced up from her phone at the menu. Too bad they don't have any baby carrots. You could relate to that better. She pointed at a picture. They do have pizza. If it comes in two minutes, it'll be just like a date with you. The group with the jolly green giant roared with laughter, and he grinned as he turned away from the window with his tray. Nice talking to you, Justine. I better go before someone drops a house on you. Justine waved her hand dismissively. Don't forget to get a straw, Rick, because you suck. Rick waved back as he walked off with his group. Just as I was about to return my attention to examining her tight rear, Justine turned around and addressed me. Why do all guys think the meaning of life is their dick? I threw up my hands. Maybe because life is too short, and so is their junk? She laughed. Very good. Eyeing my name badge, jeans, and t-shirt from a local animal rescue, she asked, Who are you dressed as? I lifted up my badge. Um, just a guy working. I'm setting up booths and assisting in the convention hall. She nodded. A man with a job. I like that. My name is Justine, and I'm dressed as the manga character Inako. Justine did a twirl to show off her outfit. What do you think? Now I nodded. You nailed it. You look exactly like her. I'm Brad, by the way. Justine gave me a quizzical look. You have no idea who Hinako is, do you? I shook my head. 
I wouldn't recognize Hinako if I ran over her with my car in the parking lot. Justine laughed and turned to order her food. After getting her tray, she pointed at an open table. Brad, you interest me. Please come sit over there with me when you get your food. I sat down across from her and asked, what's up with the jolly green guy and you? She rolled her eyes. Rick? We dated for a while, nothing serious. He's too much of a man-child for anyone but himself. We're still on good terms. Justine then swept her hand around at the crowds passing by. So, you're not into all this? You don't know anything about anime, manga, or Comic-Con. I studied her outfit. No, not really. But I guess your character is about high school age, leaves home to strike out on her own, partly because of an evil stepfather, and meets a group of like-minded kids. She relates to animals better than people, right? Justine put down her fork. I thought you said you know nothing about Inako. Pulling a paperback book from my back pocket, I held it up so she could see the title. Not much has changed since the Greeks were putting on plays. There are only so many plots. An evil step-parent is common in everything from Shakespeare to Star Wars. Justine took the book from my hand and read the title aloud. Classic Tales from Ancient Greece. She gave me a look. A man who reads, has a sense of humor and a job, and likes animals. You certainly are getting all the boxes checked off. Justine returned the paperback and pointed at the faint discoloration around my ring finger. Plus you're single, which leads to the question, why are you single? What are the chinks in your armor? You're kryptonite? You'll need to ask my ex-wife. I'm sure she can give you chapter and verse on my failings, I said as I picked up the paperback. I've been reading books of old, the legends and the myths, the testaments to time and the heroes and the rest. From Midas and his gold, to Hercules and his gifts. But clearly, I don't see myself upon that list. I pointed at some characters in the crowd. Take Spider-Man's control, Batman with his fists, even Superman unrolls his suit before he lifts. I raised my arms. I'm pretty sure I'm not the kind of person that it fits. Justine leaned back in her chair, tapping the straw from her drink on her teeth before she spoke. It all depends. Where do you want to go? How much you want to risk? She took a sip of her drink. I'm not looking for somebody with superhuman gifts or some superhero myth and some fairy tale bliss. Justine put down her drink. I just want someone I can turn to, somebody I can kiss. She gestured to a man walking by with young children on his shoulders, with a lady by their side, all dressed in costumes. I want something just like that. Justine pulled out a pen and wrote a number on a napkin. Think you can handle dating a girl that likes to dress in funny outfits? I grinned and punched her phone number into my phone. Well, if we go out, all my friends will help you make fun of me. Justine picked back up her drink. My alter ego is a grade school teacher, so I got the whole summer off. Where are you going to take me first? If you are prepared to let out your inner child, I have quite the adventure for you. Most of the events I had reserved for my aborted vacation with end were not refundable, and Justine was great sport at filling in at events like Fairy Princess for a day and even wore the cowgirl hat for the pony rides. After our third date at Chuck E. Cheese, Justine pulled me into her bedroom for a vacation time of my own. While the day belonged to me treating Justine, the night was mine. Nothing was off the table and Justine was not only willing, but initiated everything from anal to role-playing. Virgin, whore, schoolgirl, or bad girl, Justine slipped into roles faster than I could slip her out of her clothes. It was not a one-way street as Justine guided me to what she wanted and what pressed her buttons. I expressed how much I enjoyed our time together, both inside and outside the bedroom, after Justine had woken me up with a toe-curling experience. Running her hand down my chest, Justine spoke softly, Brad, my job is to keep you happy, and I expect the same from you. As long as we're together, it's just us two. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not someone who's available to everyone, it's only you and me. If that doesn't work for you, please let me go. I gently stroked her hair. Justine, they say if you love someone, set them free. If they come back, it means no one else liked them, so set them free again. But don't worry, you're not going anywhere. 
For several weeks, things had been going great, but I continued to send texts, emails, and voicemails every day to Aunt Sarah and even James. I received no responses, except for a single text from Sarah at the end of the summer, stating the day they would return. When I pulled into their driveway, there was no one there except construction trucks and piles of wet, moldy debris on the lawn. I couldn't help but suppress a laugh as I called Sarah's phone, left yet another message, and then headed back home. As my attorney had predicted, the court had taken no action on my initial complaint, noting it as a miscommunication to be addressed. Therefore, I was caught off guard when my attorney called on a Friday. Your wife and daughter are back. They're at the Charter Arms Hotel. You can meet the Metro Police and social workers in the lobby. I'm already here. I arrived at the hotel in record time and greeted me at the door and jumped into my arms, overflowing with excitement. Daddy, I missed you so much. We had so much fun. Sarah appeared at the door, clearly surprised by the gathering. Brad, um, what are you doing here? Who are all these people? My attorney thrust a stack of documents toward her. This is the court agreement allowing Anne's father to have visitation modifications. Since you didn't respond within the required five business days, the modification is granted. Sarah was stunned. What? Wait, what are you talking about? Our house was badly damaged by a water leak, and we've been scrambling since we got back from overseas. You can't take my daughter. The social worker appeared harried and annoyed. Ma'am, the court does not look kindly on those who ignore its orders. You were properly notified. Sarah looked frantic. I never saw the notice. Glancing past and, who was still excitedly recounting her experiences in the mountains, I remarked casually, Gee, Sarah, must have been a miscommunication. James! Sarah yelled, and James appeared at the door in an instant. They're taking in. James swiftly pulled out his cell phone. Everyone just stay here. I'm calling my attorney. The social worker glanced at her watch, aware of the approaching 5 p.m. quitting time typical of government employees. Sir, you can call whoever you want, but the court is closed now, and Monday is a holiday. Any appeals will have to wait until Tuesday if you want your daughter returned to stay here. As for staying at this hotel, my attorney interjected, opening a folder and distributing papers to the social worker, Sarah, James, and me, this place they have this child in is a danger to her health. The latest health department report rates this hotel poorly in sanitation, safety, and rodent control. It's on the verge of being shut down. James threw up his hands in frustration. There's a major convention in town. Everything's booked. We'll find something better next week. Sarah shot James a fiery look, then thrust the papers into his hands and dashed back into the hotel room. She returned almost immediately with a gym bag, which she pressed into my hands urgently. Get my daughter out of here now, she hissed, her demeanor softening as she added, Please, Brad, go. Get it away from this place. That weekend turned out to be one of the best of my life. And in Justine bonded instantly, staying up late eating pizza, watching terrible chick flicks, and doing each other's hair like they were having a grown-up slumber party. It was a wonderful weekend with two girls I loved. Then things took an unexpected turn. I had been gearing up for a fierce court battle with Sarah over and knowing my legal funds were limited. When my lawyer called on Tuesday, I braced myself for what I thought would be a battle to the bitter end. Brad, your wife has requested that you retain full guardianship and care of and until their home is habitable again, which should be in about three or four months. She's only asking for liberal visitation based on your discretion, with custody to be discussed at a later date. Wow! I exclaimed. Are you some kind of wizard with magical powers? She chuckled on the other end of the line. Actually, I'm a bit disappointed. I spent the entire weekend preparing arguments based on your history as Anne's primary medical caregiver, the presence of a retired military veteran RN on the property, and even your girlfriend being a teacher. Plus, the fact that you can work from home made a strong case. I laughed. Yes, my retired chief petty officer might seem like a tough, crusty character straight out of Hollywood, but he's really a big softy inside. He's got me doing logistics and planning for him now. 
It pays a bit less, but no more traveling, and I can work from home. Okay, Brad, looks like the big payday I was hoping for from billable hours isn't going to happen. Hell, your ex even shut down the best argument I had lined up about possible mold in their house. They're going to provide a mold inspection report, and you can choose the firm to do the testing. Damn. I don't know what to say. Well, don't say anything. Just pay my bill when it comes. Then things got even stranger. Justine had been picking up and dropping off and on her visits from Sarah because, well, I don't have enough middle fingers to express how I feel about my ex-wife. Suddenly, they became best friends. It started with Justine staying a while with Ant and Sarah on her visits, then the three of them going out for treats together before Justine brought Ant home. Soon, they were shopping together, going to beauty parlors, movies, and more, like the three musketeers. And was overjoyed, but the friendship between Justine and Sarah was like watching a lamb and a hyena sleeping together. You know it happens on animal TV shows all the time, you just never thought it would happen in your house, and you didn't think it was a good idea. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore and confronted Justine about it. Justine, what's with this BFF thing between you and Sarah? What, Brad? You think she's going to bite me? Turn me into her lesbian lover? No, not bite you, more like stab you in the back. Leopards don't change their spots. Are you jealous, Brad? Justine said with a sly grin. You can come with us tomorrow if you want. We're going to that new gym with the boxing workout. Sure, Justine. I'd love to see you and and punch Sarah in the face. It's not that kind of gym, Brad. Damn, too bad, because I'd pay to watch that, I said, pausing for a moment. Okay, Justine, we can all meet up at Blockbuster Video. Justine looked confused. Blockbuster Video isn't even a thing anymore. Exactly, Justine. She laughed. Remember when I told you my job was to make you happy? Yes, I do. Well, Brad, isn't happy? Does that make you happy? Of course, seeing my daughter happy makes me happy, I replied. Justine's sly grin returned. So, if my being friendly with your ex-wife makes your daughter unhappy, which makes you happy, what's the issue? Justine, you don't understand. Justine gently placed her finger on my lips. Brad, if no longer seeing Sarah would make you happy, I'd drop her in a heartbeat. But that would just make him sad, and that, in turn, would make you unhappy. Is that what you want? I felt like Justine was engaged in a battle of wits, and I was an unarmed opponent. So, I did what every guy does when outmatched. I silently declared victory to myself, cursed inwardly, and left the room. After a year, Justine and I moved in together, and then started calling Justine Mommy J. Justine, Sarah, and and continued their routine like the three musketeers. As long as I wasn't D'Artagnan, that was just fine. However, I'd be lying if I said it was always comfortable for me, but they were as thick as thieves. And my precious daughter miraculously went into remission, which was the most important thing of all. I finally asked Justine to marry me. While I would have been happy with a trip to City Hall, Justine had her heart set on a historic site booked a year in advance. So, I endured endless conversations about desserts, napkin colors, and God knows what else for months on end. Six weeks before the wedding, Justine was sitting at the table going over the guest list for the nth time, and was in the bedroom watching TV. Brad, what would you think about inviting Sarah and James? Justine asked. I think about them when I'm dunking my cookies in milk, you know, holding them under until the bubbles stop, I replied dryly. Justine laughed. Come on, Brad. And is going to be a bridesmaid. Surely your love for me overcomes your dislike of them? Justine, I love you so much. If we were on a sinking ship and there was only one life jacket left, I would miss you a lot, I quipped. Justine threw a pencil at me just as and walked into the room. Daddy, Mommy J, when are we going to eat? Justine looked at her watch. Oh darn, I'm sorry, Anne. I lost track of time. I pulled a well-worn menu from the kitchen drawer. 
No worries, let's get some Asian takeout from that place near where Marge works. Yeah, I want egg rolls. And exclaimed. I grabbed my credit card and cell phone and pointed at Justine. If I buy, you fly. Justine frowned but blew me a kiss as she walked out the door. An hour later, Justine still hadn't returned with the food. Daddy, I'm hungry. And whined. I pulled out my phone and dialed Justine's number. I'm sure Mommy J just met some former student and is gabbing away. I'll let her know you're faint from malnutrition. There was a knock at the front door, and faintly, you could hear Justine's phone ringing on the other side. I laughed as I walked to the door. Looks like Mommy J lost her keys and locked herself out again. As I swung open the door, ready to deliver my sarcastic remark, my words died on my lips. There stood a Metro police officer, his face expressionless as he held a bloody plastic bag containing Justine's ringing cell phone. In a cruel twist of fate worthy of any Greek tragedy, Justine had been killed at the most dangerous intersection in the state by a speeding truck that ran a red light. It was the same intersection where I had once contemplated ending my own life, what seemed like ages ago. The guilt of choosing the restaurant that night and indirectly causing Justine's death weighed heavily on me. I was nearly overwhelmed with guilt and grief, barely able to function. Thankfully, Marge and the chief took charge of all the funeral arrangements, as I was like a walking shell, haunted by memories in the house Justine and I had shared. Eventually, I moved back into the small apartment above the garage, seeking solace away from the reminders of her. The day after the funeral, Marge displayed the blunt empathy characteristic of Navy nursing caregivers. Brad, get your head out of your ass. I was stunned as Marge stormed into the apartment, flinging open the curtains to flood the room with sunlight and tearing the sheets off my bed. What the fuck, Marge? Can't you see I'm mourning? I protested. Marge pulled up a chair and sat in front of me, unrelenting. Morning's over. Time to join the living. I tried to retreat under the covers. Leave me be. I'm no superhero. You have no idea how torn up I am. Marge gripped the bed sheets. Torn up? Then I'll get you a cape like Superman's and you can be super upset. Listen up, Brad. Justine's gone and you can't change that. But your daughter is alive and she hasn't stopped crying since the funeral. Do something about that. Your daughter lost the person and thought of as a second mother. The best way to heal your pain is to help her heal hers. Misery loves company, but nobody loves a person who wallows in misery. With that, Marge released the sheets and lit a cigarette. The best way to honor Justine's memory is to show your daughter how to cope with loss. She gestured at my unkempt appearance. Is this the example you want and to remember from this tragedy? I sat up, rubbing my face. Marge, I don't even know where to start. Marge handed me a list. Here's a list of grief counselors. Pick one and tell them I sent you. And make sure it goes with you. She glanced around for an ashtray. And get in the shower. You smell like a goat. Marge was right, as always. Seeing the grief counselors helped in cope with the loss of Mommy J, and though it took longer for me, I gradually found myself dreading each morning less. I made the decision to sell the house and move full-time into Marge's small apartment above the garage. With no legal arrangements between Justine and me, and our state not recognizing cohabitation or common law relationships, I expected nothing from the accident that took Justine's life. So, when three checks from insurance companies representing the county, state, and the trucking firm arrived a year later, totaling a significant sum akin to winning the lottery, I hesitated. The guilt I felt over my role in Justine's death made it difficult to accept the windfall. Marge and the chief, however, had no such reservations. They practically dragged me to the bank to deposit the funds and sign the necessary paperwork in front of a notary. I set aside money for Justine's college fund and established a scholarship for teachers at the local university. Having distanced myself from Sarah, I hadn't heard from her in about a year since Justine's funeral. So, when her name flashed on my phone screen displaying Satan and Darth Vader's theme music played, I was concerned. Brad, this is Sarah. I'm at Memorial Hospital. You need to come get in, she said urgently. 
My heart raced. Is everything all right with Anne? Why are you at Memorial Hospital? And is fine, Brad. It's James. He passed away. James is dead? I blurted out, surprised. There was a pause before Sarah responded. He had colon cancer. The treatment didn't work. I couldn't help but think that James getting colon cancer and in the end felt like karmic justice, though I bit back any caustic remarks. Okay, I'll pick up and at the north entrance. James was cremated, and his ashes were scattered at the lake. I couldn't help but muse how fitting it was that his final wish made him a true ash hole when there was a knock at my door. A small Asian woman in medical scrubs handed me an envelope and hurried away before I could say anything. Perplexed, I opened it and found some papers inside. Brad, I hope you'll read this to the end and your hatred of me won't lead you to throw this letter away. I've gone to great lengths to have this typed up and delivered to you. The priest has just left, and according to the nurses I overheard in the hall, I don't have much time left. We all have regrets, and my biggest regret is that I'll die as a thief. Not just any thief, but an evil one who exploited a desperate mother's love for her sick child to commit my crime. Yes, I'm worse than any cartoon villain because I planned my robbery in a way that's worse than any common criminal thug. But karma's a bitch, and now I understand that he who stirs up shit will end up licking the spoon. It's no secret that I've always desired Sarah. My infatuation began the day she started working at our company while still in high school. Despite being only a few years older, my attraction went beyond a mere college crush. My persistent attempts and manipulations became so overt that both my father, who ran the company, and my mother, who headed HR, sat me down for a serious talk. Words like stalking, unwanted advances, and sexual harassment punctuated our conversation. Unfortunately, their warnings didn't penetrate my obsession, and I doubt I'll be joining them at the pearly gates anytime soon. I've justified everything I've done up until now, but with my life now measured in days and hours, I can see the harsh truth laid bare. I exploited a child's illness to satisfy my desire to have your wife, Sarah, as my own. I'm ashamed to admit I felt joy when I heard about your daughter Anne's illness. I didn't see a child in pain. Instead, I saw an opportunity to win over Sarah. When our company's insurance policy came up for renewal, I hired a medical insurance researcher to identify all available options. I used this opportunity to select a plan with limited coverage for the treatments your sick child and needed. It was I who used my contacts at your bank to expedite the foreclosure process on your house, hoping to drive your family into financial ruin. I didn't anticipate it taking so long, but you proved to be a formidable opponent, resourceful in finding unconventional ways to cover treatment costs for your daughter. I underestimated a father's love for his child and Sarah's loyalty to you. Impatient and blinded by my desire, I couldn't comprehend why Sarah remained with you despite my subtle hints about the benefits of a relationship with me. In the end, a mother's love for her only child prevailed, as I knew it would. Still, I was taken aback by Sarah's sudden decision to divorce you and be with me. Yet another lesson in karma, be careful what you wish for. While Sarah was physically with me, her heart and mind were elsewhere. Did you know she kept a burner phone to call your voicemail just to hear your voice? She interrogated and after each of your visits as if conducting a debriefing. The unusual bond she shared with your fiancé was her way of living vicariously through your life. Who do you think funded the law firm that secured your settlement after your fiancé's death? Sarah even waited outside places you frequented just to catch a glimpse of you. How do I know all this? One stalker recognizes another's obsession and the lengths they will go. My fantasy woman had her own fantasy man. Also, to reassure you, Sarah and I never engaged in physical intimacy before your separation. Not during the waiting period of our divorce proceedings, nor did she kiss me until after we were legally married. We were physically intimate in every way possible between a man and a woman. I state this as a fact, not to boast, because while Sarah never rejected my advances, she never initiated them either, not once. Did Sarah enjoy our physical relationship? Who can say? My previous experiences were limited to paid escorts. This wasn't the marital union I had envisioned when I imagined our future together. But what right does a thief have to complain about the quality of the goods he stole? With my last breath, I offer you a gift, 
the gift of your daughter's life. Our overseas trip wasn't merely a vacation, as in believed. It was a cover for a treatment at a research clinic with experimental procedures. This experimental treatment, not yet approved for humans, was made possible by a substantial donation to the research facility when I sold my family business to a venture capital firm. I wish I could say it was solely out of love for Annie, but I won't deceive you. I cared deeply for her, but I was willing to sacrifice everything I owned to gain even a fraction of the love Sarah has for you. Sarah ignored my advice to involve you in this decision. I felt you deserved to know, given the treatment's success rate of only one-third, with another third resulting in death. However, from the outset of our relationship, Sarah made it clear that decisions concerning Anne's well-being were none of my concern. Lastly, in a bitter twist of fate, I now lack the funds for specialized treatments not covered by the insurance plan I selected, treatments that could extend my life. I leave you with questions you must now ponder. Parents often say they would give up anything for their children. Can you accept that your wife sacrificed her life with you for the sake of your daughter? Can you reconcile that the trade-off of losing your life with Sarah was worth saving your daughter's life? Can you find it in yourself to forgive and rebuild your life with your wife? You may hate me, but your daughter lives because of the sacrifices your wife made. James Madison I nearly collided with a U-Haul moving truck as I screeched to a stop in front of Sarah's house. A for-sale sign with bank-owned property stood prominently on the lawn. Without pausing to knock, I pushed through the door to find Sarah in a worn sweatshirt surrounded by cardboard boxes. Brad! Sarah exclaimed, running her hand through her hair. What are you doing here? I thrust the letter into her hands. What is all this? Sarah's face shifted through a range of emotions as I paced the floor, trying to dispel my anger-fueled energy. Finally, Sarah set the paper down on a stack of moving boxes. James wasn't a bad man. Bullshit. I snapped, grabbing the letter. James was scum, and he knew it. May he rot in hell. I took a step closer to Sarah. Is this true? I asked, shaking the letter in front of her face. Sarah didn't back down, holding her ground. You want answers, she stated firmly, not as a question. I think I deserve answers. I shot back. You want answers? Sarah repeated, her voice rising. I was nearly yelling now. I want the truth. Sarah got right up in my face. You can't handle the truth. I threw my hands up and turned away. This isn't a scene from A Few Good Men. You're not Jack Nicholson, and I'm certainly not Tom Cruise. Just answer the damn question. Fine, Brad. Sarah said, her voice lowering before she shouted, I had T.O. stop you from killing yourself. Sarah's words hit me like a punch to the gut. I staggered back, feeling the air rush out of me. What? What are you talking about? I stammered. She looked sad as she moved a box off a chair and sat down. Come on, Brad. I didn't marry a fool. I could always read you like a book. Besides, you were careless with your computer, never clearing your browsing history or online searches. Damn it, I muttered, leaning against the wall. Sarah twisted a rag in her hands. I'm no Sherlock Holmes. If I could figure out what you were planning, how long would it take an experienced investigator to uncover the same information and come to the same conclusion? She glanced down at her hands. I was desperate. I couldn't bear to lose both you and Anne. Why didn't you just talk to me about it? I asked. Would that have changed what you were going to do? Sarah replied. When I didn't answer, she continued, I didn't think so, Brad. She stood up and began pacing the room. It was an impossible situation. If you had gone through with it, we would have lost you. The insurance wouldn't have paid out and would have lost her father and I would have lost my husband and daughter. Sarah turned to face me. Even if somehow your death had brought in some money, as you've seen from your own online searches, it wouldn't have been enough to save in. All it would have done is leave and without her father when she needed him most, and leave me without you. Sarah, you should have told me. We could have figured something out together. She shook her head. I couldn't let you live with that decision. It was on me. I had to carry that burden. 
That's not how marriage works, Sarah. We're supposed to be a team. She shook her head again. Someone had to make the sacrifice. You were ready to give your life for the sake of your family. My choice was less drastic. I still couldn't process all this new information. What about the experimental treatment that could have endangered our daughter? Don't you think, as her father, I should have had a say in her well-being? Sarah heard the anger in my voice but didn't evade the truth. We both saw Anne deteriorating every day. It was a matter of time, and time was running out. I turned away, overwhelmed. Brad, you saw Anne suffering. Did you want that to continue? I should have been involved. I retorted. Sarah shook her head. I had already caused you enough pain. I couldn't bear to burden you more. This was a chance to heal our daughter. Or lose her, I interjected. She shook her head again. A drowning person will grab at any lifeline. As a mother, I needed Anne's pain to end, one way or another. Sarah reached out to touch me, but I stepped back. Brad, everything I did was with our family in mind, even though we weren't a family in the truest sense anymore. I never stopped loving you. She wiped away a tear. There were so many times I wanted to come back to you, to curl up and die on your porch. Well, Sarah, if you ever feel like that again, make sure it's a Tuesday, trash day, I said, trying to lighten the mood. I saw a hint of a smile. If you really longed for me, why didn't you leave James and come back after and recovered? Sarah hesitated. Don't think I didn't consider it. But I made my choice, and I had to live with it. I was in my own prison. It was a comfortable jail with a kind warden, but it wasn't where I wanted to be. And I doubted you would have taken me back, especially with Justine in your life. I envied her, seeing how happy she made you and Anne. A quarter of a loaf of bread to a starving person is better than none. Glancing around at the packed boxes, I needed a break from the conversation. What's with all the boxes? Moving out? Sarah gestured at the room. The bank owns this place now. They repossess the cars, too. I managed to finance a used Camry. We're moving to an apartment near Anne's school. It's not bad, and we'll have her own room. She chuckled. No pool, though, and we'll have to rough it next summer. Her expression turned serious. I know I've put you through so much, but is there any chance we could? I cut her off, heading towards the door. Sarah, I have to go. We'll talk later. Three days later, I found myself knocking on the door of Sarah's new apartment. It had been a long three days, during which I was lost in my thoughts, according to Marge, unfamiliar territory for me. Did I still harbor feelings for Sarah? Would reuniting be beneficial for Anne? I had financial stability now, along with a secure job and benefits. Could I forgive Sarah and move forward? Was there anything to forgive, and what would moving forward even look like? While I understood Sarah believed she had acted in everyone's best interests under impossible circumstances, I couldn't shake the fear that if we rekindled our relationship, I might wake up one day missing a kidney because Sarah deemed it necessary. Seeking advice, I turned to Marge and the chief. The chief's advice was straightforward, stop drifting and make a decision, commit or let go. Marge, in her usual blunt manner, said, grow a backbone and make a damn choice. You won't get anywhere with empty courage. The sound of the door opening snapped me back to the present. Sarah stood before me in a long sweatshirt, amidst a clutter of boxes and the chaos typical of any move since ancient times. Brad, would you like to come in? And we'll be ready in just a minute, Sarah invited. Sure, Sarah, but first we need to talk, I replied firmly. Taking a deep breath as I stepped through the doorway, I recalled a line from a French philosopher, one finds their destiny on the path they take to avoid it the most.